Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 286th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Matt Cosgrove. Matt is the Director of Wealth Management for Bergen KDV, an independent RA that operates as a division of a regional accounting firm based in Bloomington, Minnesota, and oversees more than $2 billion in assets for 1,000 client households. What's unique about Matt, though, was his path to launch and build a specialized division within the firm as an intrapreneurship opportunity to serve next generation clients, and then leverage that to create a career path for himself towards leadership of the entire $2 billion RIA. In this episode, we talk in depth about how, despite his relatively young age and lack of CFP marks at the time, Matt was able to get the opportunity to operate not as an entrepreneur starting his own firm, but as an intrapreneur inside of Bergen KDV to develop and operate a separate brand catering to next generation clients. How even though Matt was given some autonomy to launch his division, he struggled with having to side hustle within the firm by also supporting a new retirement plan practice and working with their smaller wealth management retirement clients to justify his entrepreneur salary. And how Matt ultimately shifted his career focus towards a leadership path after he realized he enjoyed working more on developing and growing and scaling the business itself than his client-facing responsibilities. We also talk about how Matt leveraged his entrepreneurship experience in his side hustle of working with internal clients to become the director of wealth management for his firm at just 29 years old. How during his first year as a director, Matt dealt with the lack of trust and confidence from some staff and clients due to his young age while he was trying to create change, which did eventually lead to a few of their departures. And how going through the Schwab Executive Leadership Program helped Matt refocus and create space to be more strategic and drive growth for the firm. And be starting to listen to the end, where Matt shares how he learned, in, in hindsight, the importance of being clear about what's realistic and managing expectations up front to give room to celebrate wins later. Why Matt believes connecting with other professionals within the industry, including being persistent and staying curious, is key to creating your own career path. And how Matt has managed to avoid getting stuck on the ups and downs along the way and keep his focus on enjoying the journey. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Matt Cosgriff. Welcome, Matt Cosgriff, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. It's great to be here, Michael. It's uh, it's funny. I remember probably a decade ago stumbling across the blog the first time and thinking I just struck gold coming to kitsis.com for the first time. So it's an honor and a privilege and uh, excited to be chatting with you here today. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm excited to have you out as well. You know, you've you've actually done a couple of guest posts with us on the on the blog over the years, and including one that that you had done several years ago that I I was kind of excited to like come back to. I I feel it's feel like it's sort of a theme for the for this podcast episode now to to have you on. You had you had done this article about what you had framed as as intrapreneurship. So. You know, the industry and I guess just the business world in general likes to talk a lot about entrepreneurship, this idea of like being a risk taker that goes out into the world and creates this new business thing. And hopefully uh, uh, someone in the consuming public will like it. And then you've got a business that you can begin to, to grow and build. And and there's a lot of discussion around entrepreneurship and, and sort of the nature of it, which I feel like at least how it gets framed is a lot of sort of like taking blind leaps into the wilderness it's it's very isolating it's very alone because you just kind of go out there and make this thing and when you're getting started it's literally only you and and you had put forth this idea that I really had not heard before you had you had reached out about it years ago that well hey there's this entrepreneurship thing where you do that externally into the into the world but there's also this thing called intrapreneurship where you try to do that similar kind of sort of risk-taking innovation effort, but you're not doing it out in a brand new business from scratch. You're doing it within an existing business, within an existing organization, which has a whole other set of challenges of like, well, this is the way we've always done it here. And like, these are our existing systems and sometimes existing systems don't map well onto the new thing that we're trying to do. And so at that time, I think you were you were working on an, an intra, intrapreneurship 
opportunity around building out a service model for next gen clients and and doing it within a larger established firm as opposed to hanging a shingle. And so I, I guess a I'm just I'll, I'll be curious to hear the update of kind of how that went over the past six or seven years since you had started working on it. But more generally, just I I love this idea and framing of what does it mean to be an intrapreneur? What does it mean to be someone who wants to take some of those risks and has innovative ideas and wants to do something new and different, but is trying to do that with within an existing organization as opposed to saying, I'm, I'm going to just go hang my shingle and do this from scratch? Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly not a uh, a term that I can take credit for. I think it came about in the in the eighties, the actual term entrepreneurship. But I was super fortunate. I, I started my career at a small RIA, and actually had kind of gotten the itch to try to start something on my own. Much you know to kind of track with what XYPN had done at the time and launch in. So if you bear, I think had written an article on your blog, you know how to yes. start an RIA for less than ten thousand dollars. I think was close to what the title was, and so I had an itch to to kind of step out on my own and try to do something similar. The the challenge I ran into at the time was I was, I think, 24, 25. I hadn't quite passed the CFP yet. And so maybe didn't have sort of the experience or the track record to, at least in my mind, make that completely viable. And so I was really fortunate to to stumble across an organization, it was called KDV at the time, that uh, hadn't, you know, desired to cater to that young professional, kind of that next generation client at the time, and build something out. But they, as they sort of looked into the proverbial mirror, didn't necessarily have somebody internally that could do that. And so I was really lucky to uh, to be able to join them and kind of operate as an entrepreneur inside an organization, as you noted, and certainly a different host of challenges that come with that. But I was fortunate at that age to, you know, have a salary and be able to have quite a bit of autonomy. So help us understand a little further just what this looked like. So I guess what was what was KDV at the time that you uh, at, that you arrived? Like what was this firm business you were coming into where they were saying, "Hey, we want you to build this new thing within our existing firm." Yeah, yeah. So KDV actually dates back to to the 1940s. It started as a real small town CPA firm up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Fast forward to I think it was 2014 when I joined, and it was really kind of beginning to be a sort of a burgeoning regional accounting firm. And in 2000, they had launched a wealth management practice that when I joined was about probably 15 or so people. And so total employees at the organization was about 150 employees, maybe just shy of that across technology, tax, audits, consulting. And then obviously, I joined the wealth management group that was you know, highly integrated with the tax firm, probably about a billion dollars in assets at that time. And when I joined, I really had the opportunity to operate you know, not, not entirely independently, but with quite a bit of autonomy to build out the service model. Model, the tech stack, et cetera, to, to try to really build an engine to, to cater to young professionals. So, so you arrive, there's this existing regional accounting firm, I guess is just doing like all the, all the things accounting firms do. So like uh, tax and audit work and small business accounting, like all, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So they're, so they're doing that. They had a wealth management division within it. From back in the 2000s, which you know, very very common, there was kind of this surge of CPA firms in the in the early mid 2000s of of like adding RIA divisions and and offering wealth management under the umbrella of the existing accounting firms because they they did that back then as well. So I think you said like 15 people in wealth management when you got when you got there, but 150 plus total employees. So like you know, it's 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 like 10 percent of the firm, right? I'm just sort of visualizing that like sizable division billion dollars of of AUM which is a, a very healthy advisory firm but even it, like relative to the accounting firm that was still like this this billion dollar wealth management thing is only 10% of our at least by headcount of our of our much larger regional accounting firm like that was the environment that you were coming into correct and i would i would say the the headcount and i would probably say revenue was probably similar just in terms of tracking with the firm probably about 10% of revenue as well okay so so you're getting brought into this environment and so how did this come about that like suddenly you're talking to this firm about creating a an advisory solution for next generation clients i mean like did did you find them did they find you was this like happenstance at like a networking meeting i mean how how does this opportunity come about for you when you're you know otherwise i, I guess you'd say at the time like just a few years in 
not ready to start on your own, don't have your CFP marks yet, but trying to trying to figure out what's next for you? Yeah, it's a great question. It's uh, it's funny. I'm sure you've uh, are familiar, and I'm sure listeners are familiar. Steve Jobs had given a uh, a commencement speech back in I want to say maybe 2005 to I think Stanford, and he talked about you really can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only kind of connect them looking backwards. And at, at the time, the first time I saw it, I you know that maybe didn't make a ton of sense. I was probably still in college at the time. And so to your question, how did I get connected there? It's funny, I bumped into and met an individual that was kind of leading the sales side of the retirement plan consulting group at KDV. And this was maybe a year or two before I was even looking. And when I kind of stepped out on my own, I actually did step out on my own to try to start something, but was kind of interviewing on the side just to kind of keep doors open. And he heard that I was looking and we ended up having coffee and kind of said, hey, this is what I'm passionate about. I want to try to serve next gen clients. I've got some experience and energy around the retirement plan consulting world, and that I've always enjoyed just sort of the practice management and and leadership side as well. And he basically said, why don't you come build it for us? And I said, that sounds amazing. You mean you're going to give me a salary to basically be an entrepreneur inside of an organization with resources and and give me some autonomy? And the answer was yes. And, you know, I haven't really looked back since. It's been about eight years and it's been a really fun, fun, albeit, uh, you know, tons of challenges along the way. So I guess just help me understand a little more how this comes comes about. Like I just the number of people I'm 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 imagining who are listening who are like, I'd like a salary to launch my own thing from scratch. Like, how exactly does that happen? Like just how, how does that come about? Yeah, and I think it, you know, to be clear, it was I didn't just have 40 or 50 hours a week each week that I got to just sort of build this in a vacuum, right? I mean, I had to sort of almost internally side hustle. I know that's a common phrase that's thrown out when uh, when when people are launching their own firm independently is maybe doing a side hustle just to get some some money or revenue in the door to put food on the table, support your family. And so I, I had to do that internally, you know, doing a couple of things. I was able to kind of help on the new business development or sales side for their retirement plan practice. And then it was also working with just some traditional smaller wealth management clients and then kind of traditional smaller retirement plans as well. So I didn't I didn't have 40 or you know 50 hours a week just to solely be an entrepreneur, although I would certainly have loved that. I did have to sort of pay my way through it, if you will, in terms of adding value, which was which was good. I mean it gave me an opportunity to continue to grow in a lot of areas and I think broaden my skill set, which came back to to hopefully help me down the road. Interesting. So so I think that's powerful framing. So it it's they didn't they didn't quite go so far as to just say like here's a salary, go make this thing from scratch, you know, let let us know in a year or two how it's going. This was a like, hey, there's some things that you could be doing in the firm that we'd like you to be supporting on now. Like take some of the smaller wealth management clients, take some of the smaller retirement plans, support our our team doing some of the sales calls and business development for retirement plans. But we recognize like that's not going to take your full time job, and so you know, sort of by design, like that's part of your time. At least it helps to cover your salary for some of the work you're doing around here. We know it will have extra time for you as well. And with the extra time, Matt, like go go start getting this next generation client thing launched. Correct. Yep. Exactly. So, so can I ask like, what was the salary? Like, what were they willing to pay you to like? build this and start doing it from scratch? That's a great question. So it was eight years ago. I want to say it was maybe like 50 grand. You know, I remember coming out of college and and being 10 or $15,000 less than that. That was, you know, 10 or 11 years ago. And you hopefully brought in some new business, which as a 22 year old, I think everybody listening, I can appreciate that that's darn near impossible when you've got certain minimums. So yeah, I want to say uh-huh. it was like 50 grand. And, you know, again, right. that's 50,000 more than anybody that's out starting their own firm. So at the time, oh, that was, that was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, ten, 10 years ago, a couple of years of experience, like that was a good number you know, salaries. I mean, it is interesting, like salaries, even starting salaries for students now, like we're, you know, on the, on the new plan of recruiting side, you know, where we're placing a lot of, a lot of rising college students, like we're seeing, we're seeing folks that are getting placed in the mid fifties or even the low sixties sometimes with, you know, financial planning, education, no marks yet, little or no experience yet. Cause there's just such a talent shortage now, but right. 10 years ago, like that was a sweet salary for getting going and being able to start building a, 
building a thing you want to build and and not have to just do it from zero from scratch. Yeah, yeah, I was I was super fortunate, and again, it's just it's one of those things. Sometimes it's just luck, and you know, I I still think back to that day. I, I met the gentleman; his name was Gary Volgasser at a wild game, and I almost didn't go to the game, and you know, likely wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be where I'm at today if if that didn't happen. But I think it's notable as well. Like you, you know, you just you like you weren't getting you weren't getting brought in with a six figure salary to go build this build this big thing or to be getting a whole pile of clients while you're while you're building it. I mean, just, you know, this was a moderate salary to go start getting something started from from scratch, right? You know, I, I mean, you just envision yeah. like the firm's trying to balance this as well. Like, well, you know, we need someone to handle some of these smaller wealth management clients and do some of these these smaller retirement plans. And like, you know, it costs a certain amount for the firm just to get anyone to be able to handle those. So, you know, if Matt can handle these He's more or less covering his salary. And then if he can go build something with his additional time, then, hey, we're all winning. Yeah. And I think the other thing I would say, too, is that, and I think about this just in hindsight, is just the amount that I learned through that process. I mean, sort of building and running, a, albeit very small, right? I mean, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue, but building sort of a small practice in a low risk environment. If a client left, we're talking 2000 bucks or 2500 bucks or something like that. And so just the I know looking back, the amount of stuff I learned to do whether it be with technology or strategy or new business was um, was invaluable and so I think that part was, you know was probably the most valuable part of the entire initiative probably unequivocally. So talk to us about like the next generation effort thing offering that that you build like just what what did you actually do? Like, what did you create? What did you launch and put out there? How did it work? Yes, I was I was very fortunate to have a lot of autonomy. We actually created a separate brand. It was LifeWise, and the website is still out there. It's LifeWiseAdvisors.com. We candidly haven't updated it in, in quite some time, but had the opportunity to build out an entirely different technology stack. I mean, I the firm was using Juncture. I was able to get a Salesforce license, and you know, I think we were using MoneyGuide Pro at the time. I actually got e-money and used that, which um, inevitably was kind of a, a beta test of it. And then we ended up shifting over to e-money. So again, kind of another valuable aspect of it was just the ability to te- test different technology and, and again, kind of a low risk environment. But yeah, it was an entirely separate business line, which makes it sound a lot fancier than it was in a sense and had a lot of autonomy to, to test different things, which again, I think we were able to take some of those learnings and apply them to, to our practice. So... So I'm I'm curious about a bunch of those choices. So first, like why LifeWise is a separate brand as opposed to you've got KDV, it's already known in your local marketplace because you were a you know known regional accounting firm at the time. Like why the why the separate brand? Yeah, it's a good good question. I think it's candidly, it's probably something in hindsight we would have done differently. So we felt at the time that it was important to communicate to a different market segment, this in this case, young professionals, and that we felt like the existing brand, KDV, really spoke to more traditional business owners, retirees. And so we felt to really speak sort of genuinely to that audience. We needed a separate brand, a separate website that could speak to the pain points and issues and opportunities that that demographic was sharing. And so I think, you know, you can make a good argument probably on both sides of that. I think in hindsight, we would have probably just started for those that are, I'm sure, familiar with Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup, more just sort of let's build a prototype or a minimum viable product is what he talks about. And that could be something as simple as a brochure on KDV letterhead and just go try to sort of test that as opposed to putting all the energy behind perfecting this website and the separate brand, because it it does require additional resources, as you know, to build a separate brand brand. So that, that's something I think we might have done differently or at least not done right away. Be, because I'm 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 taking it that the end you kind of figured out, oh, I think they actually would have been fine with the KDV brand. Maybe we didn't need the separate LifeWise brand after all. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, again, just the, the brand, certainly KDV is not a household name like Schwab or Fidelity, but I mean, it had enough brand power, particularly in our St. Cloud market and, and at least enough in Minneapolis. And, and ultimately, the other thing too, is that so many of the clients, 
at least that we thought we were going to get, came through the existing internal channels. So they already had some familiarity, whether a parent was working with the tax side or they were, you know, we're doing their 1040 or something like that. So we, in hindsight, didn't again think that having a separate brand was probably as necessary, or at least it wasn't necessary up front to kind of get it off the ground. Well, I like that you mentioned the the Eric Riesling startup sort of, well, approach and, and an actual book. So uh, for anyone who's listening, well, I'll, I'll actually add a link for it out in the show notes. So this is episode 286. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 286, we'll have a, a link out to Eric Reese's startup, uh, Lean Startup. But the, uh, you know, I remember reading Lean Startup a couple of years ago and, and you know, the, the whole point to the book in essence is most of us, when we're trying to build and create and innovate something new, like we overkill, we make, we like, we build way more than we needed to build to really do the test. And the only real test is just like, if I make this new thing, does anybody in the world care enough that they'll show up with money and buy my, buy my product or service? And so we tend to make, try to make this like, you know, beautiful, fully formulated thing. And it has to be perfect in our eyes as the founder before we get it going. And the whole focus of lead startup is like, no, 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 that just ends up making a really expensive, slow, slower to grow innovation effort or new business effort. If you really want to do this, get down to like the absolute minimum that you need just to do the the test of what you're trying to figure out. And and one of the strategies even that they advocate is like, you know, if, if you want to know whether a potential new like product or service might might be compelling in the marketplace, like launch it before you even have the offering yet. Like make a page that says, here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what's going to cost. If you're interested, sign up for this waiting list. And if no one signs up for the waiting list, you probably don't need to bother to build it because apparently no one's that interested. If you put it out there and you say, here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what's going to cost. And here's what the offer is. And people get super excited. Then put the money and effort and time and resources towards building it. So I, I'm struck by that, I, I guess, in the context of what you're saying here, Matt, that like, you know, in retrospect, we could have just made a brochure of what the offering would look like under the KDV brand. Just go out and tell people like, here's what we're working on. Here's what we're planning to do. And if every if no one likes it or they're not interested or they're having trouble with the KDV brand, then like maybe you go make a separate one. But if everybody turns out just to be fine with it under KDV, then you didn't have to build a whole website and structure all the rest. Like it just cost you a, a brochure or a one pager that you had to make to start talking about and see if anybody cares. Yeah. And it was, it was probably one of the biggest learnings I had in the process, Michael. I, I look back and just think I spent so much time trying to perfect sort of the proverbial mousetrap. And I spent not anywhere near a sufficient amount of time trying to figure out how to grow it. And to the point, you'd have the best mousetrap in the world, but if nobody knows about it or is, you know, curious or in interested in buying it, it's sort of a lot of effort for not. And so I know in the book, they actually, to your example, I think Dropbox actually created like a two minute video and they just basically threw it online. And to your point, said, sign up if you're interested. And they got thousands and thousands of signups. And that was, if I recall correctly, kind of how they tested their product. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, it was if a, that many people learning. are interested. Maybe we should like build this now. Exactly. And, and you still see some of this on places like Kickstarter. Or this is a popular strategy as well. Like, where you know we're gonna we're gonna put out an initiative for a thing we haven't actually built it yet it's just an idea but if enough people sign up for it either a that validates the build or b like you can even put a couple of dollars towards it that if we build the thing you you know you you get the first version that comes out which essentially just means you're pre-selling your idea before you even build it so if lots of people show up you have the money and you go build it and sell it to them and if no one shows up all it cost you was the time to stand up the website, like not the website, the page that said, here's what we're planning to do to find out that people aren't that into it. And, exactly. then, and then you can just move on faster to whatever the next idea is that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll carry better. Exactly. So what, what was it that you built? Like, just, can you describe for us more what the, what the actual LifeWise model or offering was at the end of the day? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too dissimilar for many of the XY planning firms and others that are kind of offering subscription based planning to young professionals. So I think we tried to 
you know, we tried a couple of things that at the time we thought were relatively innovative that, you know, didn't necessarily pan out. We offered like a free access to the e-money dashboard. So you could go to the website and sort of trying to almost steal a page out of like the LinkedIn freemium model where, hey, sign up for this if you like the technology and decide to upgrade to planning. And that's great. And then we also used at the time Betterment for advisors uh, and their robo platform and offered that. And then again, just kind of a traditional, well, I guess it, at the time it wasn't traditional. I think a lot of advisors were launching subscription-based pricing, but increasingly becoming more of a traditional model, at least in terms of serving next generation. So that was kind of the service model. Again, we it was primarily the latter there. So primarily the subscription-based, but we really never got it to scale. So where did you price it? Like what what were you what were you putting out there as the price point yeah so that was that was something again you you had to learn the hard way i think we started at 1500 bucks up front and then maybe 100 to 150 a month and again what we found is it just inside of a large larger organization i mean even if you get 100 of those clients and just throw out simple number. I mean, if that amounts to three or 400,000 in revenue, if you're a standalone, that's a lot of money because that's becomes effectively your take-home pay after you cover some overhead and maybe a, you know, one staff inside of an organization where we've got offices and infrastructure and shareholders that are expecting, you know, anywhere from probably 20 to 30 plus percent to the bottom line. It just, the economics of it inside of a larger organization we found just didn't work as effectively as I think we've seen a lot of really great success in the independent space. Interesting. So just this, this whole effect of, look, I can, I can get my, I can get my hundred clients at a, you know, average of $3,000 of revenue per client. It's 300,000 of revenue and I can have a really good take home. I mean, I just, I, in practice, I've seen advisors who are, who are doing that, who are, you know, taking home upwards of 80 plus percent of that, even if you have to hire out one, one team member to support on that, you're probably still taking home north of 60% of that, which is, it could be 200 plus thousand dollars. But when you do that in a large firm, it's like, well, Matt, here's your allocation of the staff overhead and here's your allocation of the, the technology systems costs and here's your allocation of the rent and, oh, and with, you know, the shareholders want to see their 20 plus percent profit margin and you go all the way through that. Oh, and you got to get paid as well, hopefully for what you're doing. Like it gets a little hard suddenly to do it at, at $3,000 or revenue per client. Yeah. And I think one of the other challenges we ran into to, to that point, Michael, is, and you've written about this, is if we think back, you know, advisors were worried, or at least some were about robo-advisors sort of taking over. And I think you, to your point, you talked a lot about, and, and this proved out in sort of our um, our instance with LifeWise, is that technology can scale service, but it can't scale necessarily customer acquisition. And so one of the things that we ran into is it still took a lot of work to go find these people. And it's one thing if you're acquiring clients, you're going to pay 10 or 15, $20,000 a year into perpetuity. If they're going to pay fifteen hundred bucks up front and then maybe only a thousand bucks on going, there's a lot of work on the front end, and so that that was another challenge we ran into. And even being inside of a larger organization that that could refer clients, is we found that a lot of the clients we were working with on the tax side were not thirty two year old people that are launching a medical practice or a dental practice or something like that. They were fifty five year old business owners, and so just the the demographic that we were going after after was not necessarily the demographic we. Had had a ton internally so the so you notwithstanding what i know is often a popular discussion about wealth management and accounting firms which is we have all these existing clients on the tax business and sometimes in the small business accounting business that we can cross refer over to wealth management not not so much necessarily when you're working with when you're trying to create a younger clientele gen x gen y sort of service model, like great when you want business owners with liquidity events heading into retirement, maybe, mm -hmm. but that would, that was not the life wise focus. Correct. And I think, you know, the other thing I would have done differently, and I know you pound the, the drum on this a lot, and I agree with it, is we would have been more focused. I mean, we just sort of said young professionals, which 25 to, I guess, 40 years old was at tens of millions of people probably in the US. I think we would have gotten a lot more focused and tried to maybe just go after young dentists or something like that, because we do have some of those niches on the on the tax side that it would have probably better aligned and at least up front allowed us to focus limited marketing resources to that target segment. So the so the core of the offering of the like, what do I get for my 
fifteen hundred up front plus plus one hundred and fifty dollars a month. So, so I'm presuming like I got a I got a like e money financial plan up front. I get ongoing access to the e money dashboard. So you kind of like you know our your your private mint dot com just for you with with our firm. You you've got access to the Betterment platform. So you know low, low cost diversified portfolios. What what else what else was in there or or how are you like layering ongoing meetings and ongoing service into this beyond the like you've got access to your dashboard part? Yeah, that that's where we, the the service model probably mirrored quite a bit our traditional wealth management model. So we talk a lot about our five pillars, uh, which again mirrored the CFP's kind of five core disciplines: financial planning, investment management, tax planning, estate, and risk. And so that was really what we focused on, but just focused on within sort of the framework or through the lens of a young professional. And so it typically lended itself to two to three meetings a year. You alluded to obviously building out the financial plan up front and then kind of updating that ongoing. So that was really the service model. Again, it wasn't wasn't too dissimilar from the traditional wealth management model. So it sounds ultimately ultimate like you had some challenges for fully scaling this up. And I want to come back to that in a moment. But just from the ability to execute that with a growing base of clients, like, I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, how how manageable was that? Like, was it, you know, like, was the technology enough that you were able to at least service the clients profitably under this model? And it was just a question of how do we get the volume of clients? Or was it hard to even do the amount of service work that it took for the fees that you were getting paid to, you know, just deliver enough value that clients would retain and keep paying those fees? I think it was probably a combination of kind of all of the above. I think we where we eventually landed is we did increase the pricing. So I think we eventually landed on like twenty five hundred dollars up front, and then maybe one hundred and seventy five a month. So I think that would have helped just from the revenue and scalability perspective to an extent. I mean, you're still inside of a large organization with overhead, so that was always going to be a challenge. And I think we could have certainly improved and solved the volume piece. I mean, there, there's so many success stories, obviously, many of which have been on the, on the podcast or in the XY planning community. So I think we could have solved those. The challenge that that I kind of eventually ran into is I, I learned about myself, I guess, through this process that I really liked working on the business more than in it. My opportunities within the organization to grow you know, outside of LifeWise kind of presented themselves in a way where I could really continue to put a lot of time and energy into working on the business. And so that ended up just becoming more my full-time job to the point that the the real issue is just I kind of ran out of time. And so that's where, you know, we just, we didn't end up scaling it maybe to the extent that we had set out to at the front end. So how, how many clients did it end up accumulating up to? We probably put uh, effort in for 18 or so months, maybe 24 months. And I want to say we probably got 15 or so clients, you know, call it, I probably have the numbers somewhere, maybe 50,000 in revenue. I don't think it ever surpassed that. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all for now, but it was far from, I think, the success that we would have hoped it to get to. And again, it was, it was partially the two two reasons we talked about. And then a lot of the third one was just, I, I started to run out of time and saw opportunities to grow and continue to be challenged kind of come up in, in other areas of the firm. So just that, that bottleneck of like, you know, financial, financial advice businesses are, are almost never, if you build it, they will come kinds of things like just, you have to go out there and, and get the clients and, and the challenge, just like getting, getting the clients, getting the volume of clients is hard, especially if you're going to get a volume of clients is like, well, then maybe we should just go after clients that write bigger checks anyway. So like volume of clients and not not necessarily as large checks just became challenging. Correct. Yep, exactly. Yeah, true, truer words have never been spoken. If you build it, they will not necessarily just show up. And and I guess that that goes back to your earlier comment as well of spent all this time trying to figure out like what the service offering was going to be and what the structure was going to be and what the tech was going to be and all of that like perfecting the mousetrap when in retrospect you wish you'd spent more time just trying to get it out there and get getting the client quantity and the client volume going 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, I would have spent all of 30 minutes creating a brochure using more or less a watered down version of our existing service model and then spent, you know, the rest of the the next two years just trying to get clients and iterate from there. So that was, again, that was probably the biggest learning I took away from that. And again, it was invaluable. I, I, I guess I wish I had read the lean startup at the front end of that and not, uh, not the back end. But again, that's sometimes how it works. And just one or two other quick questions I want to move on to sort of the, the next stage of it. But just I was struck, like, why the tech changes? Like, why why Salesforce instead of Juncture? Why eMoney instead of Money Guide? Yeah, it's a good question. I think two answers, kind of one for each of the tech pieces. I think on the planning software side, we felt like young professionals needed more cash flow planning. And so Money Guide Pro, as you know, is more goal-based. And so we really wanted to help younger clients learn to manage their cash flow, particularly if they're potentially starting a business or paying off student loans. And we just felt like that could model that out better. And then the second piece of that being that the e-money at the time, I don't think Money Guide Pro had a kind of a vault or a dashboard. We felt like that was something. And then the third reason being that at the time we were beginning to think about transitioning sort of the the larger practice, if you will, from money guide to e-money. And that was sort of a low risk way to to test it out with some clients. So that was that was it on the planning software side. On the CRM side, we wanted to do some integrations with like HubSpot, I think it would have been at the time. And Juncture is, as you know, was desktop based. And so it just didn't have maybe the marketing capabilities. But again, in hindsight, it would have probably just gone with for sure just Juncture, because again, it it was more about just get the get the MVP or the minimum viable product out and worry about the technology later. But those are kind of the the thoughts at the time in terms of why we we use the two different tech pieces. Because just ditching juncture and well, I guess not ditching because the rest of the firm still had it, but like not using juncture and all the existing systems and getting Salesforce and standing it up and figuring out how to use it and the learning curve and all that was just like time you spent on that, that in retrospect could have been out there just trying to get more initial client volume going. Exactly. Yep, exactly. And I I am curious quickly just to come back once more on this like money guide versus e-money. Just there's so much discussion from at least I feel like from money guide directly and and granted maybe this is dated because you were building before this, but you know, like they've been building blocks they talk about you know, like setting up simple goals for younger clients so they can do the planning. I feel like there's a lot of advisors out there who kind of frame like money guides goals based planning like is great for working with younger clients because you can just kind of take quicker slices of goals and 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 move on and not have it be as time intensive as cash flow based planning. So just I'm I'm struck that when you were building a business to actually serve next generation clients you wanted to move away from money guide and over to e-money. So can you talk a little bit more of just like what, like what was not working around money guide goals based planning for younger clients? Yeah. And to, to be clear, I'm, we, I'm not going to suggest that one is perfect or that one is the right answer or, or not. I think for us, we just felt like being inside of a tax firm, or being born out of a tax firm, you know, tax planning and the integration of tax and how that impacts cash flow planning. We felt like we needed a little bit more robustness to the planning software to do that. And again, that's not to say that's sort of right or wrong. That was just sort of the way we viewed things. And so that was a big driving force behind it. But I agree. I mean, again, potentially it would have done it differently just given how scalable and simple Money Guide Pro is and how it can really focus on, okay, let's just focus on savings and then maybe you handle cash flow in a spreadsheet or something like that. So not to mention it's more expensive, but I did, I, and it did give us a really good glimpse into how the tool could be used that I think helped when we did make a fairly large change effort to, to shift gears at the broader practice level from Money Guide to, to eMoney. So last question on the LifeWise hard just i want to actually come back to to you like you know, one of the trade like one of the trade-offs for doing this in the entrepreneurship context is like i own my thing it's like it's mine it's mine to own it's mine to grow it's mine, mine to sell i get all the income as the practice grows like i get all the remunerative benefits of that so i i'm wondering like as you picked this entrepreneurship path i'm, I'm wondering like how were you going to get compensated as the client base grew? So like, what, what was the upside for you if you if you weren't building it internally and owning it? And then ultimately, just like, how did you think about owning client relationships versus 
building this at, at KDV where ultimately like it's their clients and you're bringing in and servicing them. So how did comp work and how did you think about ownership? Yeah, so comp was pretty straightforward. It was just salary plus bonus. And, you know, as, as it is today for us, advisors have salary plus bonus that's driven by um, acquiring new clients and retaining existing clients. So mine was very similar to that. The ownership piece, you know, I, I knew going in that I was not going to own the clients. It was a, you know, at 150 employees, it was a shareholder led organization. So I think at the time there was maybe 20. 20 to 30 shareholders. So I knew at some point there would be an opportunity if, you know, if the firm kept growing and I did a good job, hopefully there'd be an opportunity to, to become a shareholder and in, in, in an owner in the larger organization. But up front, there was no sort of like carve out or anything like that specific to those clients. And, you know, candidly, I, I don't know that there would have been a ton of value, at least to the stage that we got it built just at only 15 or so clients. So it wasn't something I was too terribly worried about and obviously was trying to provide value in other, other areas of the firm um, is sort of my quote unquote side hustle as well. I'm struck just by that framing that, you know, when working in a larger firm like that, and, and granted, I think accounting firms and also law firms just have have had more years and more decades to sort of establish these systems and expectations. But I find it an interesting mindset sort of shift for you that like the the goal in being successful and building this within a larger organization was if I do well, I too can become a owner, shareholder, partner. In, in the larger organization for which I'm contributing part and lots of other people are contributing parts as well. And I get to you know participate in the profits of that aggregate entity, but just the, I don't know, as I think like the, the whole game, the whole rules of engagement are different when it's not, I build this thing, I own this thing. It's I'm going to contribute to the whole. And if I do well in contributing to the whole, I get an opportunity to own a piece of the whole as well as a partner. And that the, I guess, as I think like the, the carrot, at the end of the stick is not ownership of the client base that you're building at the firm. It's the chance to have ownership of a piece of the firm. Exactly. And we're, we're uh, bringing KDV at the corporate level is really one entity. And so you'd become a shareholder in not only a wealth management firm, but a technology, a tax firm, a payroll company. And so it, you know, you're diversified from that perspective and the firm is growing. So that, that was really intriguing to me, I think as well. I know that's one of the challenges many young advisors and both out of college and just coming out of college faces, there's a lot of small practices and, and there's certainly opportunity in those, but the career path or sort of the opportunity to ownership might not be as clear. And so coming to an organization where there was 20 or so shareholders that had that achieved that, I think just gave me a little bit more confidence that while there's no guarantees, there was an opportunity there. And, and that's certainly been a, a fun journey so far. So now talk to us more about what changed. Like you were you were two plus years into this getting you know some 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 traction and and revenue starting to go on it and as you said it sounds like there were there were sort of two things that happened simultaneously like your own journey you found i actually like working more on the business than in it which you know starts leading you in kind of a a, a leadership management path as opposed to a you know, build, build a client base and serve the client's path and also you said that just opportunities within the firm started shifting, which is one of the interesting things that happens in large and large and growing firms is just, you know, as firms grow, like there's more seats on the bus to use the, the Jim Collins analogy, like the bus is growing, there's more seats on the bus. There could be cool things that you could do at the firm that literally wasn't a job when you started, but now it is and might even want that more than the the seat you had originally. Cool thing about being in growing organizations. So so talk to us more about like what what changed after a couple of years what what shifted what happened to KDB Yeah I think so within probably 6 months of me joining we signed on a pretty sizable retirement plan consulting partnership it was kind of a referral arrangement and that just catapulted us exponentially forward on that side of the business. And that was where I was sort of side hustling, if you will. And so instantly I had had a side hustle that was now becoming almost a full-time job, which again, which I enjoyed and was super challenging and a great learning opportunity. Fast forward a couple of years, I had kind of an opportunity to lead that team for a, a brief period of time. And then in 2014, our CEO of sort of the larger organization 
was stepping into a new role as he kind of transitioned towards retirement after 20 or so years in that seat. And the gentleman, uh, Dave Hinnenkamp, who's a mentor of mine, uh, actually was the the person that founded our wealth management practice back in 2000. He elevated into the CEO seat, which created an opening for the, what it was a, essentially the director of wealth management role at Bergen KDV. And I threw my name in the hat, probably thinking it was maybe 10 years too early and just got really fortunate and, and lucky to, to be able to, to get the role and the opportunity. So the last four years, I've been you know, leading our wealth management, our, our larger wealth management group. And so that that kind of instantly put a pause on LifeWise and some of the other things that I was doing because I had sort of a new, I guess, a new full-time job, if you will. So just paint, paint the picture for me, like t- timing-wise. So you like 2018, you 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 get the gig. Like how, how long have you been out of school at this point? Like how... How, how how old or how many years of experience do you have coming into like, oh, here's a billion dollar firm you could run? Yeah, that was, uh, I still sort of pinched myself and I'm not quite sure what they were thinking, but I was 29 at the time. So I hadn't quite had 30. I graduated in 2011 from St. Olaf College down in Southern Minnesota. And, um, you know, I had a couple internships before I graduated, but had by and large been in the industry about seven or eight years. And yeah, again, like I said, just got really fortunate to step into a role that I'm super passionate about. And I think learned through some of the struggles with LifeWise that I, I really did enjoy working on the business. And I'd always enjoyed being part of a great team and, and leading. And, and that was something I, again, I was really fortunate to step into that that opportunity. But uh, albeit green, I guess, to say it politely. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, how did, how did you how did you get the gig? One of the things I think we've we've grown a lot as an organization is being really intentional about our hiring process. And so at the time, they, for most positions like that, were doing pretty substantial sort of panel interviews. I think I had to go through a, a basically a apply. There was internal candidates. I don't think there was anybody external. And then had to go through like a 10-person panel interview, which was a little intimidating at the time. But nonetheless, um, in hindsight, it went you know relatively well, I guess. And I mean, that that was really it. I think I, w- I was fortunate enough to hopefully show that I was able to be relatively innovative and creative and, and curious, which I think are important traits of a leader and, you know, really had a passion for learning the industry and the strategy side and just keeping a pulse on things. And again, I, I sometimes still wonder how I ended up in the seat, but, you know, obviously very grateful for that. So how big was the team when you took it over? Like suddenly how many people were you responsible for? Yeah. So the team was about 26 people at the time. We were probably, I think almost to the dollar, probably about 4.7 million. And I want to say somewhere in the one to one and a half billion dollar space, primarily in Minnesota. But we did have a couple offices in Iowa that sort of mirrored the the footprint of the the larger CPA organization. So 4.7 million of revenue and a billion, a billion and a half of AUM. Correct. And, and I guess maybe a point of clarification too, that includes retirement plan assets. So we have a pretty sizable retirement plan consulting practice. So that the call it one or one and a half billion is both individual sort of traditional wealth assets and then also defined contribution assets. I was going to say just that, that kind of revenue to AUM ratio where you're, you're down in kind of the 30 to 50 basis point average revenue yield. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that means there's, there's retirement dollars there as well, uh, where we tend to build lower, yeah, as yeah. well as as individual client wealth management dollars that we tend to build higher. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I think back. Uh, so the so Dave called me to let me know I got my, got the position. Again, this would have been in May of 2018, I think. And you know, I hung up the phone and kind of had one of those oh my god moments. Like what what did I just <laughs> like? I got it. Oh my God, what have I done to myself? Yeah, and I think I think the the you know the scariest part is for a day I couldn't tell anybody because they wanted to let you know I communicated obviously appropriately to the larger group and I and that was honestly probably the scariest day because at that point I was feeling like oh my goodness like I have to do this all myself like I what, who am I to think that I can I can do this and then I think what I what I learned pretty quickly is at the end of the day I I. I don't have to do all this. I have to create an environment for our team to be successful. We and we're really fortunate. We've got so many good people, both leaders and advisors, client service team members, and and so I think once that 
switch kind of flipped and, you know, it was out in the open. And I realized that again, I just had to be somebody that could help kind of create an environment for the team to be successful. It was not, not to say it wasn't without its challenges, but it, it gave me a little bit more peace of mind that I wasn't, I didn't have to do it all. Well, I, I like that framing that like, wait, I don't actually have to do all of this. Like I have to create an environment where our team can be successful. Does It does, it does kind of change the stakes a bit. But I, I guess at the same time, I'm wondering that you're, you're 29 years old coming into this senior leadership role with, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming some folks who are literally double your age, many of whom have been there, you know, years or decades longer than you, because you'd, you'd only been there a couple of years at that point since you, since you'd come in on the LifeWise end. So just how, like, how does that work? I mean, how do you, how do you try to set your own sort of a, a authority or leadership with just that that kind of age experience difference of the people that you're you're leading? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It was definitely probably one of the biggest insecurities or challenges I had up front. I mean, you, you alluded to it. I mean, in some cases, people had been in the business longer than I had been alive, and so to to walk in and suggest that I know more, and I think that was kind of the irony of the role, and I think, frankly, the irony of any or a lot of leadership roles, I would say, is that oftentimes you know, frankly, many times you know significantly less about every core domain within the business, right? I mean, we have a chief compliance officer, chief investment officer, chief planning officer, and at the end of the day, I'm never going to know nearly as much as those three individuals know about their particular domain. And so I, I think once I kind of understood that that was that was okay. And in, and ultimately, again, I didn't have to be the smartest compliance person or the smartest investment person. I just really had to set the direction and try to create that environment. I think that helped, but it, it did. I mean, it's, it's probably only within the last year, year and a half have I really become super comfortable with that. And I, I've been fortunate that we have such a great team and people that I think have been super supportive of me that have sort of allowed me to, you know, to work through that. And, and I never felt like, you know, people weren't willing to listen or anything just because I was younger. So I, I think that was that was something probably more in my head than in reality. But you know, if I had come come in guns a blazing and trying to tell people exactly what to do, it I, I don't think I would have been given as much grace. So you got to find the balance between the two, I guess. So how do you go through the process of just for a term like le- learning all the things that you need to do and figure out how to do in in that kind of leadership position if you hadn't necessarily had the the experience of doing it yet. Yeah, I mean that that has been something that has been you know another challenge. I, I I'm a very curious person, I guess by nature, and I love to learn. I love to read, and so I basically just for two years tried to read as much as I could, ask as many questions as I could, lean on the people that you know were already on the team. I mean, the nice thing is the leadership team that I was stepping in to lead had largely been intact for a period of time. We made some changes, but that certainly brought a lot of institutional knowledge that I didn't necessarily have to just suddenly know. But leaning on Dave, who was previously in the seat, and then again, just being curious and I guess being humble or dumb enough, I guess I'll, I'll let the audience decide to, to ask a lot of questions and, and sort of not think that any question was off limits. And again, that's a balance. Obviously, you want to instill confidence in people, but uh, trying to just ask a lot of questions as well. So it, it's something that you're know, continuing to learn, but uh, been fortunate that we've got a lot of good infrastructure team and resources to to support. And then just recently, I guess maybe the last piece I'd add is I was fortunate enough to go through the Schwab Executive Leadership Program, which has been amazing. And that, you know, I, I wish I'd maybe gone through that a year or two prior to stepping into the role, but that has been, you know, kind of another accelerant in in my learning journey and um, I guess development as a leader. So can you talk more about that? Because I I think a lot of folks aren't necessarily familiar with with Schwab's executive leadership program. Yeah. So I I candidly wasn't familiar with it up until maybe a couple years ago. And um, our relationship manager at Schwab was invited me to to apply, or I guess I don't remember exactly the logistics of it, but I think uh, somebody internally then had to nominate you. But essentially the program was, it's a five or six course program that's a year. And so it's 30 or 40 people in very similar roles, anywhere from sort of chief operations officer to director to maybe like a managing director of an advisor team. 
operations manager type roles, really any leaders that there's no age component of it. I think they tended to probably skew a little bit sort of G2, if you will. And the topics were positive leadership, marketing, um, entrepreneurship, talent management. And then of course, I'm going to forget the fifth one, but it was an amazing program. It was basically call it maybe two hours a week, sort of an hour class on Friday, and then an hour or two of homework throughout the week. And then we obviously went through it during the pandemic. So we didn't get together the first time. But the biggest thing was really just the network of people that you that you meet, you know, not too dissimilar from XY Planning Network or other networks, but just the community that you build and the friends and resources that you develop. That's where so much of the learning, you know, comes about. But that that was instrumental in, in helping me continue to grow as well. Interesting. So two hour so I think you said like two hours a week and an hour of class, like two two hours a week of homeworky or like self directed things, and then an hour in of an in person class. Yeah, so they, they use a, a platform called Corp U, and so I think Monday through Wednesday there's anywhere from twenty ish to thirty ish minutes of kind of self directed reading and materials, recorded videos. Thursday is generally like an hour group, a small group session, and then Friday is sort of the larger cohort, if you will, that's generally teacher led with a. And some really cool professors from University of Michigan and Boulder and essentially leading courses on those topics with sort of an RAA flavor. So yeah, it was it was it was an awesome program. We actually just got back from our capstone here just about a month or so ago. So how how long does it take to go through the whole program? Almost 12 months, I think exactly. So we started it in January of 21. We wrapped in December of 21. And then with the pandemic, kind of the spike um, in January, I guess we pushed out our capstone until I guess what it would have been April of 2022 or so. So so it's about a, about a year long program. Is there a is there a cost to this? Like, is this just a thing Schwab do for their large Schwab firms or or do you have to pay to go through this program? Yep, yep. Yeah, there's definitely a cost. So it's uh, I want to say it was like five to six thousand dollars, and then obviously airfare and lodging for sort of the last class. And I, I would say it's pretty. I mean, from a pricing perspective, it's very competitive. I know there's another one we're putting one of our advisors through called G2. I'm sure many listeners are familiar. So that that's another one that we've started that, to use. Philip, Philip Palaviv's G2 Leadership Institute. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And we've had heard really good things, you know, thus far, one of my colleagues is going through that. So we really want to continue to invest in leaders. We think, you know, at the end of the day, if we're going to get to sort of our organizational goals, probably the biggest challenge is just going to be finding and retaining enough great people and uh, particularly great leaders. So that's something we want to continue to invest heavily in and, and develop in leaders into the future. Very cool. Very cool. And and because I was going to ask, like, is, is the, because I think G2 Palaviv's G2 program is just open to anybody who wants to apply. Schwab's, it sounds like you said, like you have to be nominated internally at Schwab. So presumably then like you pretty much have to be an, an RA at Schwab using Schwab to be able to get nominated into the Schwab program. Correct. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you got to be custodied with Schwab um, and then have an internal nomination. I think there's like a two year waiting period. So, you know, you can't have somebody go every year. You've got to maybe go every couple of years. And yeah. And then oh, so waiting period just being like a, a firm can't like. So, so a large firm doesn't just like own a permanent seat of like one out of every 40 is from our large firm because we're constantly rotating our own next generation leaders through. You have to be a little more selective if you're a large firm putting people through. Exactly. Yep. 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 You can't, you don't get a permanent seat. And I would say they do a really good job of balancing it out. I, I don't think there was one, you know, more than one person from any one firm. Firms ranged in size geographically, um, as well as size wise and just sort of focus areas. So I think there was a lot of good diversity of thought and learning and yeah, definitely a program I, I couldn't, I couldn't recommend highly enough. So any like particular, I don't know, ahas or takeaways for for you in in going through that program? Yeah, I think probably the biggest one was just sort of a framework or being really intentional about change management. I think at the end of the day, any any of us that are leading practices, building our own practice, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to continue to evolve and change and change is oftentimes scary. And it's, it's, it's a different challenge to do that at scale with 30 people than it is to, to change with one or two, not to say one is harder or easier. It's just a different host of issues. And so I think the framework that I walked away with around change management was something that was definitely a takeaway. And 
and, and more just being really intentional about how you effectuate change, creating urgency, painting a picture of, you know, the benefits. And so that's something as we think about a lot of the change initi- initiatives that we're trying to embark on to continue to grow, I will definitely be applying much of that learning that, that I maybe didn't have prior. So can you share a little more about that? I mean, just, I feel like that, like that label out there, be intentional about change and manage the change is sort of like, I feel like that's a thing we say, I know it's never very clear, like what that actually means, like what do you do or not do or do differently than, I don't know, than, than dealing with change where you're not being intentional. Like what is, what does it mean? Or what were you, what were you learning to do that you might not have been doing previously on your own? Yeah, so as I think back, one of the big change initiatives we've had over the last four years is is really trying to create what we call sort of the Bergen KDV way. So we had grown up a little bit in silos and having practice in St. Cloud, one in Minneapolis, a couple in Iowa. And so there was sort of different ways of doing things. And we really wanted to create sort of one coherent client experience. And so I think, you know, before having that learning, we just sort of tried to change and just make it happen. And so I think in hindsight, I would do differently. And as I think about, we're going to be embarking on changing our pricing here, you know, in the near future. And so really trying to create a sense of urgency around why we need to change, like what are the benefits both to our clients, but to our team members, whether that's being able to hire more support in the case of, you know, increasing pricing or, you know, paying people more or, being able to invest in technology. And so really trying to be intentional about that and then really strategic in trying to figure out who are the people that you can sort of use as early adopters and those that can help bring about change and get buy-in from others. And then ultimately, you know, kind of continue to celebrate early wins. That was something with like LifeWise I would have done differently is try to find early wins that you can prove that like, hey, this is working and build energy and excitement around it. So just a couple of those as examples, just again, building the energy, kind of creating clarity around the why and then getting early wins would be a couple of the the pieces of that framework that I, again I, I would have taken away that are hopefully relatively concrete. So that that's not necessarily around at least I think but that's not necessarily around like doing the change differently per se. It's like the change is still going to be the change. You had an intention to do it when you decide you were going to do it. You know, pricing change or you know create a unified the Bergen way of things. The the change management for you it sounds like is heavily focused around just how do we get the team to have buy-in to be on board to be ready to go with it where like that's where you need more clarity around the why and clarity around the strategy and like adopters who can help champion it for you and celebrating early wins like that's all at least as i would hear it like that's all how do we get and sustain the buy-in from the team for the change but like the, the change is still gonna be the change we're trying to create the the momentum around it from all the people who don't always like change naturally. It's a fairly simple, albeit, you know, challenging to execute eight, eight step change framework. And to your point, it didn't, it didn't change sort of like the initiatives that we were trying to implement change. It really just changed how I and maybe our team think about how we need to do that more effectively and more intentionally. So that was, again, probably the biggest takeaway was just how to, to do that because at the end of the day, we always want, we're always going to be changing both as an industry and as a firm. And so I think being able to do that well, hopefully will be, you know, in some ways a a differentiator for us. So what is a, like, what is a typical week look like for you at this point in the, in, in the leadership position that you have? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I I would say it it has certainly evolved. So when I first stepped into the role, I, I felt like I was probably wearing five or six hats, still doing quite a bit of client work, trying to offload some of the LifeWise stuff, um, stepping in to fill, you know, holes where maybe people had left. And I think probably just in the last six months, it's been a really cool thing to see. We've, you know, continue to hire great people and have sort of director or manager level roles that are managing a lot of the teams within the department that that tie into our leadership team and so my role has you know increasingly shifted on driving growth and then also driving sort of the strategy and then again trying to create that environment for the team to be successful and i think one of the challenges that is that has come up with that is is we get so used to as advisors being in sort of the day-to-day grind and back-to-back meetings and emails and and that 
you know, is awesome and feels good and feels like you're adding. I think sometimes when you get into a leader, leadership position where you actually have finally created some leverage and some space to think and be strategic and drive growth, it, it can almost be a little bit disorienting just because you, you start to question like, hey, am I really providing value as I just think about this problem and how to solve it? And that that's that's been probably one of the biggest challenges the last six months or so is how do you create that space and then be okay with it as a leader? Because day to day to your question, there, there's, there's more of it. And I think that's good, but it is, um, again, it's a little bit different than the constant firefighting that was kind of part of my role the first three or so years. Talk to us more about that. Just, I, I'm struck by, it cause I, I feel like there's so much discussion in the, in the, in the context of growing and scaling firms, like we're, we're doing all this work to, create more space for ourselves as leaders to have more time, right? Have time to work on the business and not in the business or to think more about strategy and growth. So just, I'm, I'm fascinated by this framing of like, I got there and I started getting more space. And then I basically started feeling guilty that I had so much free time is sort of, maybe that's my, my words on top of it, but I kind of feel like that's what I'm, I'm hearing from you. Like, you got to the part where you had the space and then all of a sudden it was like, Oh, I feel weird. I have so much free time. Like, shouldn't I be doing something? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you you just, we as advisors or managers, leaders get so used to the hamster wheel that is the, again, the day to day. And so as we we're in the process of doing our strategic planning, so our fiscal year starts July one. And so, as you know, we, we operate on EOS. And so we just had our big annual actually yesterday. And so rewind back a couple weeks and I've, you know, blocked off time on the calendar as focused time to really think about the business and how do we improve it and how do we continue to grow and give team members a great experience. You know, meanwhile, the team is working their butts off, serving clients, dealing with fires, dealing with team member stuff. And so that it, it, it is just, just kind of a disorienting feeling when I'm thinking one, three, five years down the road when so many of our team you know, caught up in the day to day. And I, that, that's part of it. Right. So I think just becoming comfortable with that and knowing that we've got really good people that can solve the day to day. And part of the role that I sit in is trying to figure out how do we navigate moving forward. So I think it's just something that will it'll come more natural as, as we continue to grow, but it, it's definitely an adjustment period, I think, particularly the last three years. So how else are you handling that? Like just are there you know, th- things you're doing to get more get more comfortable with it or to, or to recreate some of the focus for your time. If you suddenly like feel like you have to redirect the time. Yeah. I think the, probably the three, two or three things that I tried, try to do and I think are effective. And I think you're probably familiar with most of them is so the EOS or traction framework, there's a tool in there called delegate and elevate. And so I think that has been something that I've had to, to learn and get better at is it's okay to let go of the vine, I think is the the direct quote from the book, but really trying to understand what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, and then be willing to let go of the, those things that I'm, I'm not good at, or maybe I don't have energy around. So that has been one way, I think, just to maybe frame it up in such a way that I feel more comfortable letting go because at the end of the day, I'm far from the best person to handle it. And then I think also the the VTO, which is sort of the two page document, as you know, that's sort of the vision uh, or framework of sort of where you're going. I, I think just trying to keep that really center and top of mind with our one year one year initiatives and rocks. Um, you know, my job is effectively to do rocks to move our business forward, and so I, I think that's given me more comfort and you know being more comfortable um, spending time on areas of the business that maybe aren't next ninety day, but might be one to three to five years down the road. So for those who aren't familiar, can you explain delegate and elevate further? Like for for those who have lived within the EOS system, this is really familiar. And for those who have not, it's like what, 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 like what, what is that? Yeah, so it's it's uh, it's not anything revolutionary by any stretch of the imagination, but it's basically just a one page sort of two by two matrix. I think in the top left, it's like love it and great at it. In the top right, it's like and good. And then in the bottom, it's basically either don't like or some combination of don't like and not good at. And it's a framework that we've used with my leadership team. I know our executive team uses it, you know, maybe on a sort of loosely an annual basis. And basically, it's just a sort of a self-reflection of trying to put call it the 30 things that are part of your day-to-day job in those buckets and then really trying to focus in on the things that you love and you're great at 
and ultimately you're going to have energy around and then trying to really delegate those things on the bottom end of the framework, if you will, that you're either not good or you don't like, and it's draining for you and really trying to find the people that can do those, you know, almost have those kind of in reverse order, right? They're great at, and they love doing them. So that's something that we have used kind of across our organization. And I think has certainly helped us try to get, get the right work on the right people's plates. that are going to have energy and, and obviously do it really well. So all, all framed around this idea of like, we want to, we want to elevate ourselves to the things that just we, we like and we're good at, and we want to delegate the things that are below the line that either we don't like or we're not good at. And like, sounds like a relatively straightforward thing, but really powerful when you actually like do it well all in. <laughs> Yeah, and it, I mean it's it's so simple, right? But effectuating it or implementing it is is the challenging part. But I, I think when done well or at least done intentionally, it can be a really effective tool. And it's it's never going to be perfect, right? And in theory, it's going to evolve. But it, it definitely has been something I think has been been valuable for us and certainly for myself as well. And and so you said you you live in an EOS world as well. So I guess I'm wondering, like, was that is that something you did as you came into leadership? Is that something KDB already was doing and you had to learn? Where, where did EOS come from? Yeah, so they, um, I probably won't get the exact date right, but it was probably dating back to 2009 or 2010. The organization as a whole had kind of hit a, a ceiling, if you will, and it was very sort of shareholder led as opposed to sort of like leadership team led. And I think they just had made the decision that they wanted to break through the glass ceiling and that that was going to be something, that being EOS, was going to be a a helpful framework in in moving the organization forward, particularly given sort of how diverse we were in terms of solutions. So tax, audit, technology, wealth, and really trying to keep us aligned. And so when I joined in 2014, they had been using the system at that point for, was that four or five years? And we're very, it was very ingrained in our culture. And so I was, um, you know, lucky enough to step into that coming from a place that didn't use it. I quickly liked it. And I think it it honestly helped make my transition into this role considerably easier because there was sort of a an architecture or a framework that I could step into and lean on in terms of running the business as opposed to having to sort of start from scratch. So it, it's uh, I'm a big EOS fan. Um, for any listeners that want to chat EOS things and nerd out on that, uh, I'm always open to discuss because it's been, it's been something that's been really good for us and I'm, I'm certainly passionate about it. So I guess, again, for those who are listening, this is episode 286. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 286, we'll have connections out to, to Matt, to Matt's LinkedIn page if you want to reach out and connect and I don't know, nerd out on EOS or I, I know I'm, I've been surprised, Matt, that there aren't more like advisor study groups of folks that are using EOS because it's, 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 it's easier to talk about business planning when everybody uses a common system. Hundred percent agree, and I think just creating alignment, creating clarity, creating momentum, and then to I guess pun intended, creating traction. It's a great tool. So, what surprised you the most about the like this path of being a leader and and building and scaling up an advisory business? I think probably one of the biggest things is just how scarce um, and valuable time is. That that's probably been one of the things that I wasn't prepared for or just maybe wasn't aware that that was going to be as big of a challenge as it is and just the the, the amount of demands on our time. I mean, really in any role as you get into it, but um, in a leader's time, it just becomes so, so important to be able to prioritize and, and stay focused because you know, every yes is a no to something else. And so there's no shortages of things that are going to come at you. And so that's, again, where I think US is helpful is helping create that focus. But that that's something that I totally underestimated and had to get a lot better at because, you know, as I think back, when I was starting LifeWise, I was kind of just ideas and maybe didn't realize that execution is an important part of that. And there's always going to be more good ideas than there are time in the day to execute. And so that that was probably the biggest surprise is just, I guess, coming to that realization pretty quickly that to be effective, you got to say no to a lot of things and, and be able to prioritize accordingly. I know you said you're a, like an avid reader and learner as well. I mean, were there, you know, were, were there books you learned or, or books you learned, books you read or, or things you learned that just like ha- helped you? figure that out or get the clarity for yourself? 
Yeah, one, one, and I think this is probably on one of your book lists the last couple of years is essentialism. Um, I'm going to forget, is it George McEwen? I think is maybe his name. Yeah, no, uh, Greg McEwen. Or Greg McEwen. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So that, that one is an amazing book. It's a, it's a relatively quick read. I think that really helped both professionally and, you know, personally just try to get more clarity on what's important and how to prioritize. And I, I can't take any credit for the every yes is a no to something else that was entirely from the book. So I guess I got to cite that appropriately. But um, that was definitely a, a book that had, I think, an influential impact on on kind of helping me improve there. So what was the low point for you on this journey? Oh, there certainly hasn't been a shortage of those. I think probably the low point is, you know, within six months of stepping into this role. And actually, I might even go back a little bit before that. One of them was basically kind of having to come to the realization that LifeWise was not viable or as viable as maybe hoped. I think that 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 was tough. But again, I, I tried to use it as a learning opportunity. And again, in hindsight, the, the dots sort of connect. But I think probably the, the lowest point was just probably within the first six months, you know, we lost four or five people. I think we were trying to really create a new vision. And, um, you know, people, as you know, have the opportunity to, to select in, a, in or out of kind of the direction of where we, we were trying to go. And obviously, as a new leader that had people that, again, had been at it far longer in some cases than I had been been alive. That that was really tough. I think we lost a couple big clients. You know, I don't think we hit budget the first year. There was some other stuff that popped up. And so, you know, all, all in the first year when you're 29, there's a lot of self doubt that can creep in, um, or I should I should I should say did creep in, but I you know I tried to remain sort of confident in in the journey and the learnings, and again was really fortunate to have a good team and a lot of supportive people within the organization that that got us through. And you know now as I think back the last two and a half years, you know we've had the two best years ever, both as an organization, but then also as a as a department, our wealth management group, and the people that we're getting to join our team are just amazing. And, and we've had on our team, to be clear, it's both new and long-term that that's been a really fun part of the job to see, you know, we get to add new people to our, to our team and our culture. So, but definitely some, some low points and speed bumps and, uh, you know, a lot of mistakes on the way. I guess just going back to LifeWise, like how did, I don't know, just how did you handle that transition mentally? Like just how do you get through the I've been working on this thing and it was my, it was my baby and it's really not working out, but I got this cool other opportunity, but like kind of have to let my baby go. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't in some respects, it wasn't that challenging because the firm, I never felt like, oh my gosh, my job is on the line or anything. Like I I felt like the opportunities that were presenting themselves outside of my focus on that were in areas that were going to move me along professionally a lot faster and allow me to develop and and learn a lot faster. And so in a lot of ways, I was okay with it. It was just more sort of like, I guess, the embarrassment or the disappointment of like, hey, you tried something, it didn't work out. But, you know, I I grew up playing sports. And so that was, I guess, a a theme or something you learn pretty quickly in sports is you're not going to win them all and you just got to try to dust yourself off. So that was, you know, again, a disappointment and something tough, but I think I was able to see sort of the, I guess, the silver lining in it was just the opportunities that, that lied ahead. Well, it, to me, it's always one of the interesting things about the, I guess, the Silicon Tech Valley culture in, in particular is there, there's like, there's also, there's almost a nobleness of like, here's the thing I went out and tried and like, heck in that environment, you know. I raised a bunch of money. We spent a bunch of dollars. We built a whole bunch of stuff. It didn't work out. Companies long since gone. But like, man, I went out there and tried it, and and went through that, and went through that process. And and there's there's almost a badge of honor of like if you if you done that, succeeded or not, or like had to grow big or not. Certainly, nice when it grows big. But you know, there's just there there's no shame in that. In, in a lot of the tech world, because it's so hard to do just the, the respect for having done it and taking the leap is really powerful. Our industry, I feel like it's really different for better or worse. We're like, we're a lot more results oriented than process oriented, maybe. So like, you know, if we tend to look at things like AUM and how big the, the, the thing grew, as opposed to 
I tried to innovate and I actually took the risk and made the leap and did the thing. So just I'm 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 struck by that distinction. It, it's not often I find that I hear folks that just have kind of got, gone through what you've gone through and, and are just comfortable say like I tried something it didn't work out and now I'm doing a cool thing and it's working great and like that's just all part of the journey. Yeah, and I, I think it, it. I guess I would. I would add to. I mean, it's it's easier to sit here today and say that. I, I don't know that I would have had probably. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it still felt a lot worse <laughs> yeah, in real yeah. time at the moment when you had to accept that transition. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think with age or time, I guess comes perspective, and so I, I think that you know, hopefully, I've been able to broaden that perspective and, and again connect those dots to Steve the or steal the Steve Jobs um, analogy. But yeah, d- definitely during when it was happening, it was not it was not fun to to go through that, and certainly filled with you know frustration and disappointment. Anything that you wish you had done differently in this? Like, just I'm struck in familiar, and I'm struck in particular your comments like within six months of stepping in the role, like lost four to five long-term team members, lost a few big clients, like budget didn't hit. So like, you know, are, are there things you know now that you wish you could tell you from four or five years ago as you were getting ready to step into this role of, like of what you would do differently? Yeah, probably the, probably the biggest thing is I think, you know, I probably came into it with my eyes a little bit bigger than my stomach. And what I mean by that is just thinking that we could sort of like solve all of the world's problems and all of our problems within like three months. And so that was something I, I remember vividly, you know, sort of setting out within the first couple months, like, hey, here are the 10 things we're going to get done and we're going to get them all done by like the end of July or something like that. And, you know, we got two of them done or something like that. And and so it was it was I think important for me to learn and I would have done differently is not under promise and over deliver, but just be really clear about realistic expectations in terms of managing, you know, key initiatives and dealing with issues. And so that was something that, you know, cause it, cause at the, at the end of the day, if you do that enough, you start to sort of erode trust because you're saying one thing and you're not doing it. And so that was something that I, I, I learned, tried to learn from really quickly that, you know, be really clear about what's realistic, obviously still push the bounds of what's possible, but also sort of set expectations, particularly new in a role. So that would be one thing. And then, um, you know, there's a great book out there. It's called The First 90 Days. I don't know the author, but that's something that I, of course, did not read the first 90 days, but probably read, you know, after the first year. But I, I think it, it talks about, which is something I wish I had known or a framework I had, just how stepping into different roles can be different depending on the situations. And I, I won't remember all five of them, but like one is turn around, one is just sort of like continue the momentum. And then there's a couple others. And so I think I would have, and I think it's applicable for any advisor, any leader, you know, when you step into a, a new role, understand what, what you're stepping into and then sort of build the plan according to that environment, because the plan is likely going to look way different depending on the situation. And it's probably obvious to say that out loud, but I think just the way the book frames it up was, was really helpful. Very cool. So again, uh, for folks listening, this is Episode 286. So if you go to kids.com slash 286, we'll grab a, a link for the, the first 90 days if you want to go find the book and, and, and check it out. So Matt, what, what advice would you give younger, or newer advisors coming into the industry today and trying to chart their own path? I think that probably the biggest thing I would say is just stay really, really curious and, and always be willing to to reach out. I've been amazed at how supportive and open our industry is in terms of particularly in the RIA space and just in, in terms of being willing to share everything from you know strategic decisions to how do you solve this problem to comp info i mean just literally you you reach out to somebody it's amazing how willing and supportive the advisor community is and so i think that's something that you know it can be kind of intimidating when you're 22 or 23 coming out of college and um, reaching out to somebody that's been in the business for 20 years plus or minus but I, I think that's something I tried to do, try to get involved in FPA. And so I, I just would encourage people to be really curious and tap into the industry, tap into your network, obviously, of avid Kitsis readers and the XYPN community. Again, I, th- I think that's hard to do when you're first out of college because you may not have the connections. But if you're curious and have that desire to learn and grow, that would probably be the biggest thing. So I think I'd hopefully try to emulate that through my career. So how do you make that happen in practice? I mean, like I hear you in our industry is really 
open and willing to share. You know, I've, I've, I've found that as well, but just how do you make that happen in practice? I mean, just are you like, are you literally cold emailing people? And if so, like, what do you actually say to get that conversation going? Yeah, it's, it's a good, good question. So I guess to, to be more specific or sort of tactical, I mean, a couple of things I would encourage those getting into the business. You know, I leaned pretty heavily on our alumni network. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I went to St. Olaf College in, in Minnesota, and they have a pretty robust sort of alumni database that I was able to tap into. And again, you can go in there and filter by fields or um, different sort of criteria. And I think then just then it's as simple as, you know, if they've got an email, great. If not, find them on LinkedIn and reach out. I, again, I it's amazing how supportive people are in the industry. But then also, if you say, you know, hey, I went to your alma mater, there's usually another level of energy and openness to to connect. And so that would be one way. And then just what do you like, what were you asking them when you reached out and just to like, hey, I'd like to pick your brain. Can I get you coffee? Can I have some time on the phone? Like, I've got a particular question. I just want to like feed at the font of wisdom. (laughs) Like, What's the like what's the pitch? What's the outreach? How do you actually open these connections or doors? Yeah, I mean I I would say any combination of all of the above. Certainly in, in today's world, I think being able to do that digitally for thirty minutes on a Teams or Zoom meeting. But my my approach is usually just, hey, I you know, I stumbled across you on the alumni network, either in the industry or curious about getting in the industry, and I'd love to, you know, love to learn from you and just hear more about your career. And, you know, people inherently like talking about themselves and so, you know, people are genuinely pretty open to sharing their career and, and wanting to help people too. I mean, obviously people want to help people too. So that's another part of it. So yeah, I, I would say that that's kind of how I approached it. I was fortunate enough to have a pe- couple people in my life, a hockey coach when I was in high school and a uh, college friend's dad were both in the business. And so that was kind of another in. And then I think the, the, the advice there is just to, to sort of st- stay proactive, right? People that are mid-career or far along in their career tend to be really busy. And so it's sort of incumbent upon you as that younger advisor getting into the business to be the one potentially reaching out, you know, a couple of times a year to grab coffee. It, it's generally not going to go the other way. And again, people are always, at least in my experience, happy to help. It's just a matter of, you know, you got to stay, stay visible and sort of on top of it. I, I find there's also just a, a good parallel for that, frankly, for any of us who end out in a business development role as well, that like there are a lot of people who may be interested, whether that's interested in mentoring or at least sharing some of their time or, you know, in, interested in doing business with you and, and hiring you as their advisor, but like they're busy and busy people like just something else came up that, that moment, that hour, that day in their life that they just didn't have the time or the capacity or the mental bandwidth to reply and say like, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. But like no reply doesn't necessarily mean they're unhappy or even that they're not interested. Sometimes it just means I just don't have time to deal with this at this exact moment. And so if you're persistent and follow up, like sometimes the sixth one is the one that happens to actually be the moment that they're ready to say yes. And it's not because there's anything negative about the first five. If they're not saying no, so it's, it's okay to politely, persistently follow up, they might just be busy. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think the, the same wisdom applies, you know, when trying to get new clients too, right? Just because they didn't respond to the first voicemail and email doesn't mean they, they don't have energy around working together, but people are busy. And so I think that, that, that applies beyond just uh, sort of building a network for your career, but to, to other aspects of the business for sure. Yeah. No, no means no, but yes, no response yes. can just mean like I'm I, I just didn't have the opportunity or the time or the bandwidth to deal with this. So if you keep trying, there's a decent chance it'll it'll go better on a future attempt. Yeah. And then the, the key is to get to a yes or a no as quick as possible, right? So that's that's part of the part of the deal. So as as we wrap up, this podcast is about success. And and one of the themes that always comes up is just the the word success means very different things to different people. And so you're on this wonderful path of success with with you know leadership in the firm of a you know a very sizable business at, at still a, a relatively young age by industry standards. You, you know, you get lots of time to continue to grow and compound it from here. So you're, you're on the successful business and career track. How do you define success for yourself at this point? 
Yeah, I had, uh, as a longtime listener of the podcast, I had a sneaking suspicion, Michael, that question might be coming. So I, I tried to, possible. I tried to, I've tried to reflect on it. I think, um, you know, as I've thought about it, I, I think it, it kind of comes down to success to me is really the opportunity to do what I, what I love and I'm passionate about and, and really to be part of a great team. That's something even since I was a kid, I always loved being, being part of a great team and, and ultimately all sort of in the name of trying to have an impact on people's lives. And, and to me, that is, you know, in my current role, that is more about impact in our team members' lives and allowing them to grow professionally and developing. That's really success to me because I know at the end of the day, that's going to, you know, that's going to serve our clients well. And so that that's kind of how I think about success. And it's it's certainly a journey. And that's, I would add to that, you know, being comfortable, enjoying the journey, both kind of the ups and the downs, again, not to be cheesy, but that's certainly a, a part of it that um, I think falls into that because there's certainly a lot of, a lot of low points. That's kind of all part of the ride. I like that. Lots, lots of low points, but that's part of the ride. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thanks so much, Michael. It's been a privilege. I appreciate all you do for the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.